Near the end of Final Fantasy VII, you unlock a secret scene flashback thingy detailing Cloud's true past, as all this time he had a PTSD-level cover-up for his time spent at Seoul. Hey, wait a minute. I already talked about this. <laughs> Out of the three headless horsemen, Tabata got to direct the last and arguably the best game out of the entire compilation. Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII. Just like The Last Order, it would flash out the story pre-Cloud and focus on his inception by way of a Zack-themed brainwashing. However, unlike Last Order, it doesn't start right in the fucking middle, nor does it end before the end. In fact, it starts off years before that, as more than anything, it is a tale about Zack and his silly little adventures. Thing is, is that the dude has a bit more backstory behind him than just being this guy who happened to save Goo Baby Cloud. He dated Aerith for one, which was hinted at in the OG. He also worked for Shinra during many a pivotal moment and was instrumental in Sephiroth's breakdown. All of which is expunged upon pretty fucking well, I'm gonna be honest. It's just that this is Square Post Soft and they can't just make a game that just is what it is. Shit always needs to be unfinished, made with faulty tech, have had a rocky development or have seemingly been written by chimpanzees. And where I couldn't find anything indicating that Crisis Core had any of these issues, they did, for some ungodly reason, <laughs> include a bunch of new characters who would awkwardly fumble over the overarching lore with theatrics, sloppy pacing, and above all, a metric fuckton of gacked. We still have much work to do. My brother. What? Why would you do this, Square? Why? Why? And that was exactly the thing, my hard R bazingas. They couldn't exactly write a tension-filled story about Zack and Cloud because you already know what was going to happen to Zack and Cloud. Most of everything what either did was already written beforehand at least to some degree, so new things had to be added that would strengthen this plot's plight for the here and now. So they gave Sephiroth two new first-class buddies, Genesis and Angeal, one of whom also being Zack's best buddy, and additionally there would also be a cute Turks girl so that Zack would be able to have a love triangle of his very own for a little bit, and loads and loads of Shinra missions taking place around the globe in which our boy can interact with these folks in order to really show what a good guy he is. Which they do, as I said, quite fucking well. If anything, Crisis Core really excels in presenting fun characters having some top bro banter between Zack and Cloud, Zack and Angeal, or <laughs> Zack and anyone really. You can practically feel the dicks rubbing together with every wee quip, shared personal detail, in-joke, meme, and cheeky facial expression. Zack is such a happy boy, you guys. He loves his job his friends, doing squats, and killing people. He the type of Bazinga to wake up from a fucking helicopter crash only to say, Well, that's a fine how do you do? Brush it off and move on like it's nothing. He literally laughs in the face of danger on multiple occasions and even has a cute little phone call with his would-be girlfriend while Neo fucking Bahamut is being summoned right in front of him. He is very much on the Zidane Lloyd Shulk spectrum of the fun likable protag. The realest boy, so to say. A proper swashbuckler that, while certainly a bit archetypal in a way, just really works for me when voice acted well, and <laughs> voice acted well he is. It's easy to take a character like this and turn him into an annoying asshole like Peter Pan or Square's very own Tedious. And that's pretty much it as well. Much like its bigger brother, Crisis Core 2 is a game about character. For one, Cloud's actually portrayed like what he is for the first time, with his voice actor shitting all over his performance in Advent Children, actually doing the emotions good. But also just like, look at how incredibly friendly all these faces are animated. Cloud really is the cutest boy, Zack really is the happiest boy, and Cisne and Aerith really are the cheekiest and nicest girls, respectively. Oh. You might see the odd PSP plant here and there, but overall this game looks pretty fucking amazing, which helps its characterization efforts tremendously. I mean, you think it's dank that they got Cloud decently right, but how about the fact that this is the first actual time you really get the impression that Sefi Boy is the okay dude the original game claimed him to be. There was maybe a whole 30 minutes in total throughout the entire fucking thing of him saying things that weren't all like Mother. Reunion. Ugh. And even during those scenes, it still had the spoopy music playing. It still showed him laughing at his own mind boggles for no reason. 
He is pretty much always a creepy dude despite the game's best efforts to tell you that it wasn't always like that. And here you finally fucking see it. He has a legitimately friendly cadence to his voice. He helps Zack out multiple times, cracks jokes and even smiles without coming across as an eerie bastard. Which, even though you know that it's coming, makes his big villainous reveal all the more revealing. Shut up, okay? Fr Friendilily and Revealy are totally words, bitch. When Cloud first met Aerith, he was all like... <coughs> but when Zack first met Aerith, he went all venture capitalist on her innocent cheeky meme ass, thus turning her into the flower-selling mega pimp you know and love. You probably never questioned it much in the original game, but Aerith did not seem like the type of person who would cook up such a lucrative scheme, so <laughs> it does actually make sense that some black-haired spiky scumbag was behind it all along. And that's a neat dick-warming touch if I've ever seen one. As are a lot of other things in this game, like are you able to join these dumb little fan clubs built around the three main fuckos that have their entire own story arc? With all the clubs breaking down because of plot happening, but then you can also join the seemingly unrelated Loveless Appreciation Club and then have them join forces to make one big mega club and all of that is optional and fits in well with the characterization theme that I made up. I totally could list off tons of shit, like the Thunder Gun soldier who thinks his troops can beat the elite, thus forcing you to train with them, whooping they asses every time as he squirms to find excuses. Or this one dude who keeps getting lost on the many Shinra buildings floors, which at first is just a funny little meme until like 10 hours later when he's revealed to be a Wu Tai spot. Or the fact that you can test drink experimental new potions, get cheeky with the girls who think Jack is cute, help out Josef Mengele with his experiments while being completely oblivious to the fact that he's evil cause Zack's just too nice to fuck his ass, and a whole bunch of other shit like being able to listen to an entire company's voicemail history that I totally just didn't list off right now. Every NPC has something neat to say, basically, which makes the exploration fun and stuff and blah blah blah, the same shit what I said with Final Fantasy VII. Only to a much lesser extent. Not for a lack of skillage or effortage, mind you, it's just the PSP was one tiny ass bitch and thus it was mostly reserved for tiny ass games. Not that Crisis Core is short at all, but its skill certainly has been toned down a tad and the game's area suffered for it. I mean, the fact that the same fucking upper plate NPCs are also used in the slums alone already takes away quite a bit from the punk-ridden leather-clad 90s atmosphere that the original had and it also just looks too clean overall. A lot of the levels are just straight paths with a few bends just like in Final Fantasy XIII and the more basic low-poly geometry does not complement that design in any way. And sure, it's cool to see certain world map areas like the land surrounding the Chocobo farm be given a bit more detail, really showing off the sheer breadth and skill that these locations were always meant to have, but that change of perspective along with the severe loss of detail lays bare one massive fucking flaw in Midgar's actual design. Just be the cloud to my Jesse for a few seconds here and take a look at this bird's eye view of Midgar. Anything like stand out to you at all? Well, what stood out to me was its scale. I mean, cities are generally pretty fucking big, right? You can't exactly frame New York, London or Paris in one single shot quite like you can do with Midgar. Which is fine, <laughs> don't get me wrong, but already that shows us that Midgar isn't really all that big. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or this is the widest fucking angle ever and the Shinra building is fucking massive. Anyway, in the original game it is implied that you can't see the sky from anywhere within Midgar due to the giant fuck off plate. The dingy, grim, dark, edgy vibes of the actual pre-renders help support that implication really really well. But even still, if you just run to the right for only a few seconds in Sector 5, you can reach the outer edge of Midgar and when you go there later for plot reasons, it is revealed that here is where the skyline becomes visible. So technically, wouldn't that mean that one's always able to see the horizon from anywhere within Midgar? Question mark? Well, I think that its actual size was abstracted slightly due to visual limitations and its artistic direction. And thus, no, <laughs> probably not. During Crisis Core's development though, it would seem that someone must not have gotten the fucking memo as you can clearly see the goddamn sky. Aerith straight up says that she's never seen the sky. Zack even makes his good boy promise that he'd one day show her. 
it's romantic. It's cute. Only it's uh, it's it's right there. Hello, you guys. I I can see it literally right there. Goddamn. It's really fucking broken. Again, the old game's abstract stylings were absolutely not meant to be shown from this angle, as now Midgard generally feels like the entire thing is runnable. Well, I mean, it is, but it wasn't ever supposed to feel like it was. Know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. Good luck with the remake, assholes. Luckily though, the game isn't all that serious, save for some shit near the end. Which is a big part of the reason of why I love this game as much as I do. You straight up cut down air raid missiles with your basic bitch sword that neatly conga line up for a good throbbing. All of Yuffie, uh, th th I mean the treasure princess's emails go straight into the spam folder, which is a meme touch, I will say. And it even managed to continue the epic saga of nausea, which is in reference to Yuffie being nauseous on the plane in Dirge, which is in reference to Yuffie being nauseous on the plane ride in Final Fantasy VII, which was expanded upon at that when Cloud comforted Yuffie by telling her how he always used to get sick during missions, which now is expanded upon once more in Crisis Core, when you see Cloud vomiting up a corner having just come out of a helicopter. That is... I actually don't know what that is, but <laughs> I appreciate it to no end. Going on said missions, by the way, is pretty much what the entire game is. You get to visit Wutai, Junon, Gongaga, Costa del Sol, plenty of Midgar, and even some new locales, all of which are drenched in the game's main theme, being a kinda shaky plot about Zack being the nicest guy working for the baddest guys with a few kinda niceest guys. It never quite reaches spec ops the line levels or anything, but it is highlighted in lighthearted manners that strengthen the main game a wee bit, which I wish to highlight too. Those air raid missiles, for example, happened because the main villain guy lost his shit in a town and Shinra needs to clean up the evidence. They barely give Zack any notice and leave him behind to fend off a few bombs all on his own. And that alone gives a decent sense of how Shinra and the Turks handle their business. As does being part of epic betrayals and seeing them being reported on in Shinra's own newsletter as killed in action. Not to mention how your friendly neighborhood jokey commander guy refers to the poor people in the slums as distortions and how we must rid ourselves of these distortions. All the while, Zack is dicking around down there hanging out with a kid who needed to resort to stealing because of his dying mother and Aerith also lives there, I guess. And yeah, I really dig that. They easily could have given the Shinra a friendlier face just as they have done with the Turks, but they left it as murky as it always was. Even Zack himself refers to the Shinra butchering the people of Wutai, turning it into the tourist attraction it is in the main game as the war is over, everyone is happy. And when confronted with this by Wutai troops, it becomes clear that he operates under the assumption that Mako is good and that it helps people. Which it also does, as you do get a bit more of a taste of the upper plate and how normal of a town Midgar can be outside of the slums. It's pretty great stuff, not gonna lie. Wow, Thor, you must really like this game. All you've been doing so far is sucking its dick. Well, that's going to end right about now, as somewhere in between turning Sung into a lovable, huggable, cute boy instead of the woman slapping, nearly world destroying, just following orders man guy, what he actually is. I'm counting on you. the whole gag thing, I gotta say, this game has some bizarre fucking plot choices. Thing is, is that the big dick kicker of this game's story is the fact that one of the three main first class soldiers, Genesis, ends up defecting. As he does this, he takes other first classmen, and also Zack's best friendo, and deal with him, thus leaving Zack, Sephiroth, and what's left of the Turks to figure out what do. I mean, do they mercilessly kill them, like their orders imply? Or do they try to reason, reach out to them, friendship? Well, as it turns out, Genesis and Angeal were also clone people, just like what Sephiroth is, but he, he doesn't know that yet. And also, they can clone themselves and end up somehow spawning an entire militia together with some funny-looking scientist dude who appears out of nowhere called Hollander. I'm not a fan, so to say. 
Not because I think that any of these are particularly bad directions to take per se, but mainly because they're executed really fucking poorly. Chaos. Souls. You are a former member of Soldier. Your cellular structure has already mutated. Hollander, you did it to yourself. Yes. After nearly being killed by Genesis, it was really all I could do to survive. And for some reason, my clothing also degrades when I degrade. <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, as to how the game sacrifices detail because of its system of preference, I fear that the story contents might also be somewhat rushed. Not in the unfinished, leaving me hanging bro kind of way, a la Final Fantasy XV, but in the sense that things happen really fucking fast. Genesis deserting happens off screen before the game even starts, then Angeal fucking off occurs literally only an hour in, and sure, they joke around for a bit, fleshing out the fact that he and Zack are best buds through clever use of subtext, blatant expository dialogue, and cheeky facial animations, but still, such a reveal could have been way stronger had they built this up even more. Before writing this, I spoke to my super charming friend who is super intelligent, and he felt that you don't really get the sense that Angeal, Gak, and Sephiroth were actually close friends, and yeah, <laughs> he was right. In fact, from what I could tell, there's only one scene hours into the game that's supposed to highlight how tight they asses were. However, all they do in that scene is fight, going way overboard, actually nearly killing each other as Genesis loses his shit, requiring Angeal to step in, so really the only thing that I got from that was that Angeal hates fighting, though we knew that already through his conversations with Zack, and that Genegact is a murderous fucking psychopath who literally has no redeeming features whatsoever. And that's exactly the main thing as well. Genesis is just too much of a theatrical anime villain man to ever give off the impression that he was once an okay dude. He kinda has the same issues what Sephiroth had in the original, I suppose. All the while, the game tries to spin this narrative about how cool these three used to be and how nice they were and just... Ugh. The only thing you get in this direction is right before the final boss where Zack finds a photo and a diary entry about how Genesis apparently made some sweet tasty juice. And daddy likes his juice. And don't even get me fucking started on the clones thing. <laughs> It's introduced so fucking casually as well, like, oh my god, it's a Genesis copy. A copy? Yeah, his traits can be transplanted. Oh, okay. Like, I'm fucking sorry, but what? <laughs> People making endless copies of themselves that have like full army gear and shit is already dumb enough as it is, but by the time they start jumping out of the water in full scuba gear, it becomes a fat pile of fuck. Even after Genesis is dead, he's still controlling the copies from within the livestream or some shit, which makes it pretty hecking apparent that it's nothing but a lazy plot contrivance made to ensure that the game can use some lazy ass palette swapped enemies, and yeah, in a way this being a PSP title makes it a bit more understandable due to the technical limitations, but that doesn't mean that I have to like it either, which I don't. Every time someone utters the phrase Genesis copies with no sense of irony or self-awareness, a small part of my soul dies off in pure cringe. Unlike Last Order, Crisis Core does actually add to the Nibelheim incident. In some ways, that's fucking great. Like the ghost hunts around town, hearing Sephiroth's voice actor read lines out loud that were clearly never meant to be said by anyone. And this little bro-bang moment between Zack and Cloud in the hotel room is fucking bellissimo. All of these things, including the fact that the game builds up to it with emotional weight quite well overall, turns this scene into this. However, some additions made are considerably less great. Quite dumb, even. Anything involving Hollander's dumb fucking voice, 
Gax just now mentioned copy bollocks with him deteriorating as well, which somehow affects his clothing. And also that said Gax ends up showing up during the big Roth reveal, which was a scene that was perfectly fine as it was or quite bad, given the implications that these additions bring. Being that it's not so much a big reveal anymore as it is a stark overreaction to a thing we apparently already kind of knew. Like Sephiroth being a lab experiment worked originally because he was THE lab experiment. A dirty little secret gone rogue upon self-reflecting, but now it's like a fucking orgy of lab specimen all trying to out-edge each other, constantly dying and coming back and just fuck, fuck, fuck. Which is why Crisis Core is a flawed masterpiece. Genuinely great at times, actually strengthening Final Fantasy VII, which is something none of the other media in the compilation even come close to doing, and also it makes me feel. Like actually tearing up levels of feel. But all of that stands aside the now with Final Fantasy XV being out apparently typical Tabata directing quirks. The dude's a hopeless panderer, a crowd pleaser, a fan server with a bad case of the major demographics and the action gameplay hybrid that doesn't entirely work and seems more like a bit of a blueprint. Can't say that I dislike the game at all though, as I do really love it, believe it or not. And hey, it emulates pretty fucking well too. You may have got a few frame dips in my footage here and there, but that's actually a handbrake compression thing and has nothing to do with the emulator, my PC, or the game's overall performance. It ran great, looked great, and playable in 60 FPS all the way till the end. I uh, bring this up not to pawn off some piracy, but because as much as I want to believe, I don't think we'll ever be seeing this beauty getting an HD port anytime soon. See, Gact owns his Gact face, and as the owner of which, he said no. So like, <laughs> legal issues happen and stuff. Which, honestly, that's as fitting of an end to the Final Fantasy VII compilation as any. It may very well have been the thing that brought me closer to its universe, but at the end of the day, it was still a project mired by confusion, bad decision making, and people being in positions that they maybe shouldn't have ever been in. Of course, that hasn't stopped them from milking this shit even further, as there's two whole mobile games which are bad. Gloat, Zack, Tifa, Sid, and Aerith and Yuffie also all show up in the Kingdom Hearts's Lightning could dress up as Cloud in her returning. You visit a Mako reactor and the Nibelheim area in World of Final Fantasy, and I'm sure all of those mashup garbage games like Final Fantasy All the Bravest and that one that has the book in it, I forgot its name, no not Tactic Advance, I meant the other one, have plenty of Final Fantasy VII related shit in them as well. Oh, and uh, I guess there's also that like remake thing or whatever it is, which will probably disappoint everyone even in case of a maze. And <laughs> I greatly look forward to the fallout and a wee chance of just having a stroll around Midgar once more. So it's pretty much a win-win situation on my end. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's it. Our three main villains would go on to direct, write and produce many other half-baked good but flawed and questionable Square Enix games and Final Fantasy VII still gets gummed on by just about everyone regularly. And with that, it is the end. Or should I say...